Hi, my name is Igor Alexiev, and I am Senior Partner Solutions Architect at AWS. Hello, my name is Subhasis Bhattacharya. I'm Data and Analytics Partner Segment Tech Lead at AWS. And today we're going to talk about building an internal data marketplace. Excellent idea. But why are we talking about building internal data marketplaces? Don't we already have concepts such as data catalog, data warehouse, data mesh, data lake house? The reason we are talking about this is because there are still challenges with these concepts. Especially, the challenges are especially around data consumption. Before we go into details on how to build an internal data marketplace, let's talk about these challenges. Customers are frequently asked these questions. Where I can find the data? How do I collect it? How do I get access to the data? And these are not the only questions they're asking. They're also asking, how do I secure it? What if I need to delete some of the data? Or with whom do I share it? Um, so what happens when these challenges are not addressed? So Pisces, what do you think? Igor, when the challenges are not addressed, organizations struggle to make data-driven decision-making. As a matter of fact, Gartner um, did a survey an overwhelming majority said they are dealing with data challenges. 31% said lacking the right data is a big challenge. 21% said poor data quality is impacting them. Only 14% felt confident with the data they have. What is data quality? Let's dig a little deeper into it. Completeness is a big factor of it. Uh, which is indicator if the functionality can be delivered based on the availability data. Accuracy, what this data says versus what really happened in reality. Consistency, different results from diverse data sources, so which one to trust? Validity, if the data is valid, for example, you're expecting data set in a particular format, but it's coming in different format say date, for example. Uniqueness, can you identify one particular data? And integrity, can you connect data within or across the organization? Data trust depends a lot on the data quality. And what good is the data repository if you cannot trust the data sets? And these challenges also exist in some degree in public data marketplaces. But there, they are being addressed. For example, there are data brokers or, for example, there is a service such as AWS Service, AWS um, Data Exchange. Many companies have this as a sole business model. And customers trust these marketplaces to enough, trust enough to pay for the data. They trust the quality, they understand how to find the data sets, they know the provenance of the data, and they understand how to ingest and how to consume the data. Obviously, there is something in here. Can this maybe work for enterprises, suppliers? Yes, Igor. We think the same model can apply to internally generated data. AWS, along with key partners, have created a model, loosely coupled architecture, called internal data marketplace. Within internal data marketplace, we have integrated data collection, data ingestion, data transformation, data storage, and uh, consumptions with data security and data governance. With internal data marketplace, we have introduced shopping cart experience for ease of data consumptions. Integrated solution provides a view of universe of the data for one organization. On the left hand side, we have data producer in this picture. There could be many type of data producers from online transaction processing, um, OLTP databases to, um, to um, IOTs. We are sending real time data. On the right hand side, we have data consumers. 
we are cognizant about making the data consuming experience a delight and emphasized on ease of consumption. So data consumers here in this internal data marketplace, they can easily search data, they can review the data quality score and add the data set to the shopping cart and check out and get access as a unified seamless process just like they would do as an e-commerce site. Great, but before we dive into each components of the marketplace, let's talk about what customers expect from their data today. Um, customers definitely want uh, more value from their data. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, we'll convince you that data, internal data marketplace can help you with these challenges. Data is growing exponentially. Customers are getting data from many new sources. Um, there is IoT sensors, there is log data, um, there is um, customer interactions online with the applications and mobile applications, web-based application, mobile application. Data is increasingly diverse. You get logs, you get semi-structured data, like you get nested data like JSON, you, you have uh, unstructured data, and you have your traditional tabular data. Um, data is used increasingly by many personas. There are data analysts um, that are used to work with Excel, but there are also SQL analysts, uh, there are data scientists, there are data engineers. Um, also, data is analyzed by many applications. Um, there are real-time dashboards, there are there are traditional reports um, in, for example, data scientists may be using data models, uh, using uh, machine learning models to analyze the data. At the same time, customer expectations are changing as well. They, explode, they want everything to be easy to use on any device that they have. They expect everything to be cloud native. Um, they want to take advantage of elasticity that cloud um, Cloud offers ability to spin up and spin down resources whenever they are needed, ability to scale and be only charged for the, um, for the services that they used. They also expect seamless experience and they have a preference for self-service um, uh, service. So suffice this, let's double click on the concept that we, concept that we are proposing today the internal data marketplace and how it can help customers. Sure thing, Igor, I'd be happy to. Let's talk about the internal data marketplace. So in this block diagram, we have six building blocks of internal data marketplace. Four of them building blocks associated with the data lifecycle. So it starts with data collection, um, data integration, data transformation, data storage and consumption. Now, those are the standard components of data lifecycle. Now, our customers might call it differently, but at the end of the day, we're really doing those four actions. What we have done, we have integrated data framework, data governance, and sensitive data protection within the internal data marketplace framework. So, for example, during data ingestion, we are making sure that um, the schema is right, so we do not cause any block or logical corruption downstream system. Same time, while ingesting data or during data transformation, data storage and consumption, we are making sure the sensitive data is protected. So at any point in the data lifecycle, we are integrating data governance and sensitive data protection uh, with each of the building blocks. Thank you for the overview, Surpasses. Now we are going to dive into details of each section. Uh, um, that, that, uh, and um, you might be wondering why I'm putting the hat on. I am going to be acting as the devil advocate, devil's advocate. Um, you know, you can think of this one of your teammates who always objects to everything. 
and Sapasis will try to persuade me that each section, each that component of the framework is important. So, we're gonna start with um, governance. Governance sounds great, governance and lineage, yeah, but my data lake may be small, so building it an internal data marketplace with lineage, um, I, and I maybe not needed for me. I am get. I know where my data is coming from. Surpasses. How can this help me? Igor, small today, big tomorrow. Complexity grows very quickly. I know you have data domain SMEs. And SMEs, they are struggling to keep up with the changes and the request. Let's dig, deep, let's dig deeper into each of the building blocks. In this case, we are intentional about defining the scope of data governance. Because data governance over the period of time has evolved and there are multiple definitions. In this scope, we're talking about data discovery. Data discovery is to scan the data sources based on connectors and gather available metadata information automatically. Data catalog, metadata for the entire data set, organized, categories, cataloged for easy searchable format to cater multiple type of data users, such as business, development, management, and operational. Information such as business definition, technical definition, critical data elements, data sensitivity tags, data quality, and many more attributes are stored with data catalog. Data lineage, this is really reverse engineered to target map the source of the data so that data trust is built. We want to know where the data originated from. Data discovery, Metadata related uh, to data specifications that describes the data structure. For example, data model, entity relationship, diagram, knowledge base, all comes under data dictionary. Data taxonomy, this is categorization of data such as HR information to employee, product information or transaction data, how those data is categorized under which bucket. Data classification. Data classification is based on sensitivity of the data. For example, SSN, date of birth, those are severity one. Credit card, expiration data could be labeled as severity two. Data stewardship. Ability for data stewards to collaborate and enrich the metadata. KPI definition. Ability to create and store the enterprise KPR in one central location so everybody can come and see it. There are few ways to implement it. AWS such services such as Lake Formation, Glue Catalog supports data governance. We have implemented using our partner solution, Colibra, which is very mature in data governance space. And when we show the demo, we'll touch upon the Colibra's data governance aspect of it. This sounds great. I love the SME reference here. Job security for me and my team. But seriously, I do want my engineers to grow and I want to grow my customer base. Having data lineage captured uh, will help me understand where the data is coming in a more formal way. Um, catalog will help uh, focus on the platform instead of answering questions daily about where a particular piece of data comes from. Um, classifications, I don't need to manually go and mark individual attributes, what they are. So this is great. I, I totally get it, actually. Now, let's talk about data protection. I understand GDPR, HIPAA, but what if I don't have those requirements? Do I still do need to worry about data protection? Igor, you still have RBAT requirements and you may have stricter requirements in future. Sensitive data protection is the integral part of the data lifecycle. 
Role-based access control is most common and effective way to protect sensitive data. There are many ways to protect data such as encryption, masking, tokenization, hashing. More and more new standards are coming up. PCI, CPA, GDPR, H, HIPAA, those are well known. There are more than 20 privacy laws right now operational. And there are more than 20 dozen of certification required for privacy. 82% countries with e-transaction laws in today's world, 66% countries with privacy laws, and 56% countries with the consumer protection laws. So what we can see that future, you'll have more and more regulations coming in and we have to be ready for it. There are multiple ways of implementing uh, the data privacy and data security. Now AWS, we have AWS key management services, AWS identity access management services. For this demo, we have implemented one of our mature partner solution, Predigrity. And during the demo, we'll show you how the data can be tokenized seamlessly while ingesting the data directly. Oh yeah, I completely forgot. Yeah, what if our company gets hacked or somebody got an unauthorized access to a data set? Uh, Role-based access control, masking, tokenization will help us avoid these headaches. I totally get it. Thank you, Sapazis. Now, collection. This is hard to argue. You can have an internal data marketplace or a data lake or a lake house, data lake house without collecting the data. Even me, the contrarian here, is at a loss. What's the, yeah, suffices. Sure, Igor. Let's dig a little deeper. Purpose of data collection module is, well, to collect data from diverse sources. There are multiple ways of collecting data. You can have real time, near real time, batch mode, and the combination of all those. Batch mode is traditional way of collecting data, but real time is getting, or near real time is getting more and more popular. Why wait for data availability? If the data is available, why wait for the batch mode? Can we make the data available? What we are proposing here is metadata driven data collection. So that every time there's a new data sets coming on, you are not writing a new data collection module. And based on the metadata driven approach, you can save up to 90 to 95% of your development time. For this demo purposes, we have used AWS tool, AWS Kinesis family for data collection. There are a lot of other tools available also for data collection. For example, here we have mentioned AWS data migration services can be effectively used for data collection from the diverse sources. Good stuff, Sophisis. Uh, having these concepts formalized is very helpful. And I totally get metadata-driven approach to the development of the data pipelines. This helps with scaling projects from you know, hundreds to thousands of pipelines. In fact, in my previous life, uh, we were surprised by the customer when suddenly they asked us to, well, well, let's replicate these across all the tables in the system. And it was a hard pivot. Having um, our data pipelines um, driven by metadata helped us uh, a lot, actually. So I, I totally understand this. Uh, this, is, this is great. Now let's talk about ingestion. I have something to object to, really. The, didn't we just talk about collection? Collection, ingestion, same difference as my daughter puts it. Isn't, isn't it right? Igor, ingestion is a distinct stage that involves metadata management. Schema management is a big part of data ingestion. Validating schema during ingestion will save downstream applications also can potentially stop logical data corruption. Validation data contract happens in this layer as well. You want to make sure that all your source system who is feeding data to the downstream system 
you have a contract defined and you know if there is a change in the contract you need to figure out what to do with it if it does not match the contract do you reject the data do you accept the data do you accept part of the data all this logic is written in this layer this layer plays a big role in sensitive data protection as well so here during the schema registration or schema validation you can figure out what is the data classification and if the data is classified as sensitive data you can actually protect the data by calling an api to either encrypt or tokenize the data so in this demo we'll show you that we're calling protegrity to tokenize the data but um, other services available too, um, you know, Amazon Macy's, AWS Lambda. For implementation purposes, we're using AWS Lambda, which is internally calling Protegrity to tokenize the data. Yep, I love the, um, the fact that we are dealing with schema evolution, because schema evolution is, is a hard challenge. It creates headaches for downstream application, applications. Also, pointing out this discrepancy early on and having data classified and tagged will, having it done in automated fashion, will save me a lot of time. I am super grateful for this surpasses. Next, transformation. Hard to argue, but why do we need to formalize it? Isn't it self evident surpasses? Igor, this section is super important data transformation where the meat of the business logic is written for easy consumption right from aggregation normalization denormalization data cleansing filtering hydration everything is happening in this layer the scalability cost and ease of use are usually the key three decision making criteria for choosing the tool we are using AWS Glue for data transformation and we'll be able to see that in our reference architecture. Um, get it. In fact, I did have a feeling that I was sometimes writing the same transformation again and again. And I know that AWS Glue ETL service has a list of standard transformations. There are situations, for example, when um, going from relational data to document data model and where this the transformations are predictable for example you can be embedding an, uh, an object for a one-to-one -one relationship or you can be denormalizing many to one one to many many to many relationships it's great to have this um, transformations uh, formalized this way you don't need to write them again and again it saves me time i Super excited about this. Now let's talk about consumption. Consumption is important, but I already have something in place in my team. Um, what else here to talk about? I know my consumers, they know me. I, yeah, what, what, can, what else can we do here, Supasis? Yes, Igor, I'm pretty sure you do have data consumption, but things are changing and uh, we, we always talk about the changing, how to leverage the new technology. Staying ahead of the curve will help you to be more agile and grow in your marketplace. In data consumption, we talk about business intelligence. Business intelligence, you can implement descriptive predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics and operational analytics. This is where the decision making happens based on the data. You can implement machine learning algorithm for your prescriptive and predictive analytics. Data warehousing can mean part of it, data lake, semantic layer, all part of the data consumption. This is where actually the realization of the entire work happens. You know whether the, how important the information is for data driven decision making. Now this area is growing significantly and the big data market is ex growing exponentially. And there's a lot of mature tool over there. AWS Redshift, data lake created on S3, has, S3 has become a de facto standard for data lake. 
QuickSight has evolved quite a bit. We have NLPs and a lot of machine learning algorithm in build as part of QuickSight. And Amazon Athena, you can go to diverse data sources with Amazon Athena and bring the data set into one place. For the demo purposes, we have used S3 as a data lake and Amazon Athena connected to the data lake to get the data sets for, for data-driven decision-making. Uh, I agree. Staying ahead of the curve is important. I love being ready for future challenges. Having ability to support customers will, will help with the success of, um, for my team and our platform. And I can see already some customers want to report. Some, for example, analysts uh, while, uh, and business users, while others want data sets such as data scientists. Um, and, this, and operational people typically want real-time dashboards. So uh, having all this um, formalized is, is super helpful. Now, how does this all work? And how do we implement it? Great. This is my favorite part, Igor. So we talked quite a bit about justifying why do we need internal marketplace. Now, if you are convinced this is what you need for your data-driven decision-making, the next step is building it. And we're here to provide you the step-by-step -step information. Let's talk about this logical architecture. If you see middle, bottom, end user. So let's say I'm an end user. I start with the data catalog search. Now my intuition might tell me to go to database and start looking at the data. But often that leads to a lot of confusion, frustration, incomplete data sets. Here we are recommending to go to the marketplace where you have the internal data catalog. From internal data catalog, you can search the data set. You can review the data quality score. You can have data stewards adding the information, enriching the information, so you know exactly what data stewards thinks about the data and what others thinks about the data. You can see the data lineage, so that helps you to build the trust. Is that data coming from an old DP database or is coming from somebody's Excel, which may not be trustworthy? This is the place we can ask for the permission to get the data, if you like the data set, and get access to. So this is really a one-stop shop and gives you an e-commerce site experience where you search for the data set as a product and you like it, you add to the basket, check out and start consuming. So I have a couple of questions about this. Um, let's say, um, so the consumers or end users is in this diagram, do they know where the data actually is coming from? Or is this abstracted away from, away from them? For example, data lake, uh, data coming from data lake versus an NLTP storage. So we are hiding the complexity, Igor, by providing one-stop shop. They do not have to know where the data is coming from and where it lands. They can easily get the access without knowing that. But if they would like to know, to get the build the trust on the data, they have the capabilities of knowing it. They could see what is the data lineage, where it is coming from, and where it is stored. Great. Uh, I have another question, actually. Um, so, is it fair to say that data catalog is my primary user experience with the marketplace? Yes. So, data catalog it works like a product. So just like you'd search for the product, here is the data is the product. And you get all the information related to the data as part of the product. And you start consuming it just like you would in an e-commerce site. Great. I can't wait to see how this is all implemented. Excellent, Igor. Let's talk about the implementation that in the reference architecture, what we have built to make it work. So what we're showing here is on the left-hand side, 
Amazon Kinesis Firehose, which is getting the data in near real time from the source system, integrates with Lambda and calls a step function. In, uh, internally, that step function calls another Lambda function, which calls the Colibra data catalog in the real time, does two different distinct operations, validate schema and identify sensitive data. Once that is identified, it calls the next Lambda function as so uh, to integrate with Protegrity. So now I have the information which is sensitive data. With that information, I call Protegrity to tokenize the data. The next step is another Lambda function where my business logic is written. So logs writes the data into the staging area. From there, another Lambda picks up, which calls a glue workflow. And glue workflow, this is where the lot of business data, business logic is written, data curation is written, a lot of data transformation algorithms written, and it writes down to S3 as my data lake. The next is that data lake is integrated with Athena so that I can come and consume the data through Athena. Also, very critically, it's integrated with the lake formation for fine grained access control. So let's say I'm an end user. On the right hand side corner, you can see me as a data consumer. I'll start with the data catalog, which is Colibra data platform, metadata platform rather. So we go to Colibra, we do a data catalog search, we review data accuracy score, and we request the access right there itself. Now you can have an automated approval process or you can have another individual to approve it. Now here in the demo, we'll show you that another individual approves it after validating it. Once that's approved, it automatically goes and updates the lake formation fine grained access control. And also it updates the Putigrity RBAC module so that when I'm ready to consume the data from Athena, I do not have to go anywhere else. Right from one marketplace itself, I get access to the data and behind the scene, it actually made an API call to make the data available for me. The next step would be Igor to show you the demo and see how it really works. Before we have a demo, I actually have a question. I see Lambda functions here. Is Lambda the only way to do it? Igor, Lambda is one of the way of doing it, but it's not the only way to do it. Here we're using Lambda can integrate it with the step function to call Colibra and Protegrity. You are absolutely okay to use your application or ETL tool to connect with Colibra or Protegrity and do the exact same function. Sounds great. I can't wait to see the demo. Go. Very excited to show you the demo, Igor. So what we have done here is we have created a data set for a company, fictitious company called Octane. And that data set is combination of three data elements. You have the customer master where all the customer information is stored and then card issuer where the card information is stored and also you have the transactional information. Here in this, you're gonna click, uh, we are in the uh, summary screen, we're gonna click on the um, diagram to show you the, the, the data elements. So it's loading the data elements. On the left-hand side of the screen, you are scrolling up and you'll see, let's zoom it a little bit, and you see the Octang card transactions we were just talking about. And then if you go down a little bit, uh, we'll see uh, we have three more data. This is card, um, customer card map, and customer master. So as a as a data consumer, this is exactly what I was looking for. This is a good data set, but I'm not happy yet. I want to see more about this data, so I'm going to click on the detail screen. When I click on the detail screen, I want to see a little bit more about this information. You know the definition of this uh, data set. So I see some of this definition of this data set, which is great, I like it. 
I, I keep scrolling down. I see there's a missing data quality rule, but that accepted, uh, uh, is corrected, that's great. I see that there's some sensitive data elements, so I'm pretty happy with that. That's exactly what I was expecting to see. At the bottom, I see rating. So I'm very happy to see somebody use that data and that star rating is four star rating, which gives me a good comfort feeling, but I'm still not happy yet. I want to see the data quality scores. Is that the good data quality? What is the basis of the giving the four star? So I'm going to go back and click on um, the data quality. Once I click on the data quality, it's going to bring a data quality score and see 100%. You know, click, drill down a little bit. Uh, what is the basis of this 100% data quality? I see overview, um, screen, um, click on the detail, and I see that each data set and there's some rules associated with it. And each of them, they ran uh, and, and, and zero rows fail and data quality score is 100%. I'm going to scroll down and uh, make sure that um, you know, the data um, sets are 100% um, for all of those, and I do see that. The next step is um, I'm going to check um, what is the data elements associated with those data sets. And I see that uh, customer mastered is there, you know, and I see the data elements. Also in the middle, I see the data classification score. Um, see credit card number, education, which is should be classified information, first name, which is classified information as well. So I'm I'm happy with that. Let me go and see the data, or whether I can see it or not. Do I have access to it? So I'm going to click on Athena, and um, I'm going to run the query, see if I can get access to it. Um, and since I haven't asked for the permission, so I should not see the data. Uh, on the right-hand side, table and the view, I do not see anything drop down, so I do not have access to it, which is which is not surprising. You know, I haven't asked for the permission yet. So I'm going to go back to, um, again, to the data marketplace, which is Colibra screen, and I'm going to add that data set uh, to the data basket just like I would do in the e-commerce side. So I'm going to click on that um, data basket, and then it's going to create a task for me. So as you see, it's a data basket. I'm going to see the data basket, uh, and do you see the created data basket and create a checkout? While checking out, it wants me to add some information. What is the purpose of this? So I'm going to, you know, I need to put something. So for demo purposes, I'm going to say dot, dot, dot. Also, it asks me to add what is the start date and end date. You know, it's auditors make sure that the, the permission is given for a specific period. It's not an elevated permanent access. And for what purposes I need the data element, um, data access. So I select that from the dropdown that I need this data access for, um, for conduct um, the research and the promotion. And then, um, you know, submit this information. And once it's submitted, and checkout is already completed, it created a task. Now, in real life scenario, there'll be somebody else who'll be approving it, but for demo purposes, it, it's the same person who's approving it. So we go to the approve button on the right-hand side. Now, as an approver, I need to figure out what I'm approving for. So same thing before approving, I click on that data set, I go back and I check what this data set is comprises of. So similar process, I'm going to see in the diagram, uh, what is the data set it is made up of, of, and I should see the same information, what I saw while asking for that information. And, and again, I'm going to see what is the rationale for, uh, for permission. So I see that conducting a promotional activity, I'm good with that, I say, okay, and then approve it. While it's getting approved, Behind the scene is going to make an API call to our um, to our um, lit formation. Now this is another one. We want to make sure that I validate everything before approving it. So um, now everything is all set. I say create a request. While creating a request, is going to make the API call to lit formation, and uh, it's going to allow me for the find and access control so that I have access. Um, so and and once that is done, 
um, I should be able to go and see Athena um, that the data is um, available for me. So here it says task is completed, which is great, fantastic. And I'm going to go back to Athena and um, see whether I really have access or not. If I refresh the screen in Athena, I should see in the database column, those database, Doctank database should appear and the table name, this table, the three tables I wanted to have access, it appeared. So what happened was that we made an API call through Colibra screen to the lake formation to give me the access, which is fantastic. I'm going to run the query uh, to see if I get the result set back or not. The query is running and uh, query completed, and I see the result set. But what I see that the name, first name and the last name, they're all jumbled up. You know, those are all tokenized. Those are by design because those are all sensitive data information and those are not given unless I go and run protegrity, um, you know, detokenization information. So here itself, I'm going to go back to another screen where I have written some query uh, for the protegrity to untokenize the data. Now, those are the um, UDF functions uh, written to call protegrity. Um, but here also, since I haven't asked for sensitive data approval yet, I should not see clear text information. And this is exactly what I see. Still, it's tokenized. And that is not a surprise. Uh, you know, it's working based on the design. So what I'm going to do is go back to, again, the marketplace and ask for detoken permission to detokenize the data now i'm going to go and uh, ask the owner of the data set and i know who's the owner the marketing place and i'm going to go back and click on the data set which i need to detokenize so i'm going to say request to lake formation category and it says it, it's created a workflow now once created the workflow it's going to create a task and it's going to go to approver to approve um, the data set now here for the demo purposes, you know, same person is approving the approver, direct marketing wants to see what I'm approving and why I'm approving. So this screen clearly tells, um, you know, why I need that data set, what is that data set and what kind of approval we need. I'm approver, I know this, uh, uh, you know, what information is needed and why it's needed. I feel good about it, I approve it. Now, Task is created, and what is happening now is that Colibra is making an API call to Protegrity behind the scene and updating that role-based access control. Um, now here it gets created. Now while it's making the API call, um, you know, um, uh, it, it's really updating the role-based access control as I was explaining. And once the task completed, I should go back to Athena and run the same query which I ran before, and I got tokenized data. I should be able to see the detokenized data. But before I run the protected query, I will run the simple query first to see tokenized data. And that is the expected behavior because in order for me to get a detokenized data, I need to run the UDF function in protegrity. So I'm going to come back to uh, the, uh, the query which I ran before, um, the second tab. And here, um, you know, I have the UDF function. I'm going to run it to see the detokenized data. Now, when I ran the first time, I still saw the tokenized data because the API call, it takes a couple of seconds to um, get the cache refreshed. Now I'll wait for a couple of seconds and run it again. And this time I should really see a detokenized data. Um, so it's coming up, it's running, it's making an API call to Colibra and here they go. So same query, now I see detokenized data. So that was our demo, Igor, um, and we, we successfully demonstrated that through one centralized screen, how the access permission is managed, and also it's convenient for user to avoid going back and forth from multiple system, entire thing is centrally managed. Back to you, Igor. Thank you for the great demo, Supasis. Let's recap what we've talked about today. 
We've talked about how internal data markets will help you with uh, data quality, data lineage, how will they will help you with uh, consumption experience, provide you with uniform provisioning, and improve your data discoverability. We talked about data quality, we talked about data ownership and data lineage. We've discussed uh, how a role-based access control can help you with internal data markets. Um, and all this helps with creating a, a place where you don't have dark pools of data. You have data catalog to help you with. Um, and you also, we, we want to make sure you understand that you're not alone in building these, the internal data marketplace. There are native AWS services that surpasses mentioned many times, Glues, um, Athena, Macy, um, Lambda, but also there are partners that can help you with. Um, you don't need to build from scratch. And before we end the presentation, I want to talk a little bit about data monetization. Um, in a sense, um, we already built the um, scaffolding for data monetization. Um, if you just look at what we built, it's on the left-hand side of the, of the slide. Uh, essentially, this is indirect data monetization. You have internal data producers and you have uh, data consumers. If you squint it at, it at the diagram just the right way, you can think of this architecture as uh, being applicable to direct data monetization. You can, for example, add external producers of data to mix with existing data sets. And because you have all the controls in place, you can add uh, external consumers. Um, this way, you can be either monetizing your existing data sets, you can be mixing and matching with external data, and monetizing this combined enriched data set. You can add some value to the existing data. Um, and this probably is uh, a topic on itself, but I wanted to leave this presentation with the thought that you're building a foundation for data monetization. So I'd like to thank you for coming to the session. Thank you all. Thank you, Igor, for some great questions.